gentle readers and yes it's you i'm calling you gentle deep inside you are gentle gentle readers i want to begin today not by saying welcome to everything is everything but by saying thank you for watching this there are 84 trillion videos on youtube or something like that they comprise 617 billion hours of content or something like that and yet you are watching this show there are 8 billion people on this earth constantly increasing that number because we are a horny species and yet you are watching ajay shah and me so you know it's a good fortune that you are doing this and we are truly grateful that you are so thank you for that and i want to begin uh, the, the show today ajay by asking uh, you uh, an unexpected question uh, we said we'd each ask um, we'd ask each other an unexpected questions to get started and my question to you is this what is the luckiest thing that has ever happened to you the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was that i got to be part of the early years of the national stock exchange explain so it was just dumb luck that so i had finished my phd in the us and uh, there would obviously have been possibilities to live in the united states to be in the united states and uh, this was 1992 1993 i finished in 1993 and uh, the great indian journey of opening up an economic reforms had begun in 1991 and i had a gut instinct that uh, there was going to be a dramatic time in india and you know would you exchange a walk on part in a war for a lead role in a cage so i thought that it would be better to be in india it would be more interesting it would be more challenging i had no idea what was going to happen i relocated myself to india and then lo and behold it just so happened that around that time uh, a great amazing team arej patel ravi narayan chitra ramakrishna etc were building the national stock exchange and i got to be a bit player in that process and it was one of the most interesting and exciting times of my life and i couldn't ask for better and it was just dumb luck that i happened to be there at that time okay amit i want to ask you a different question okay what is the biggest mistake of your life baskar pagle rulayega kya there are so many mistakes <laughs> you want me to pick the biggest pick one the biggest of them i mean yeah all of us make thousands of mistakes okay we should have no pride our life is littered with mistakes but you got to pick the worst so i'll i'll pick a broad mistake i think the broad mistake in my life and you know uh, it, it's related broad mistake so big biggest broad mistake in my life was not working hard enough all through my uh, career you know in the sense i i, I won't say career because that sounds like you know there is a particular goal and all of that but i just didn't work hard i was always floating in my head lost in daydreams thinking of grand plans not building processes not building habits all the advice i give today to my writing students on how you build processes how you build habits that last a lifetime how our dharma is to keep on working and not think of reward and etc etc um you know i didn't do any of that and by the time i realized it 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 you know a lot of time had passed i was about to say it's too late but it's never too late um but a lot of time had passed and the decades pass very fast one doesn't realize that and behind this mistake i think is another sort of meta mistake and that is the mistake of um not enough self reflection i came to self reflection too late in my life i think most of us don't do any self reflection and it's tragic if you just take 5 minutes every day and just think about yourself you'd be amazed at what you would see if you can do it honestly and you can course correct in a lot of different ways so i look back you know there are many people who will say that i am the same now as i was 20 years ago i'm afraid i can't say that 20 years ago i look back and i don't like the person i was at all and uh, and i can look back now and uh, kind of see how blind i was to myself right and how lost i was you know i'm so talented i'm so intelligent i read so many books i can do this i can do that arrogance which comes from for example you know being able to study in one hour what others would take 10 hours to do and you think you're the cat's whiskers and that's really terrible you know in a previous episode on productivity we've spoken about uh, the growth mindset and uh, we've spoken about that seminal study which showed that uh, you know which uh, did an ab testing on a on a group of kids and it showed that those who were praised for their qualities you're so intelligent you're so smart 
uh, don't tend to do so well after that. They get entitled, they stop working hard. Those who are praised for their effort and they are told that you worked hard, you are a trier, you know, they kept trying, they kept working hard. And I, I think that is incredibly important that in in writing, I often say that focus on verbs, don't focus on adjectives. So in a very different context, focus on verbs, focus on doing, focus on working. Uh, so that, you know, I look back and I think of it as the biggest mistake I made. But the point is, could I have helped it? No. Because I can say that now that I am the person that I am now. And I can say, hey, I shouldn't have done that. But at that time, without, you know, going through life and changing, you know, I wouldn't even have considered the option. I, I, I would have, you know, at some level, I would have thought, ha, roj bad ke habit karo, do ghanta likho, ye karo, wo karo. But, you know, so sometimes I think you have to let life happen to you and it is what it is. Youth is wasted on the young. Youth is wasted on the young, indeed, and wisdom is wasted on the old. <laughs>
or like anyone who excels in anything, spent thousands and thousands of hours becoming good at what she was doing till she could write songs like, uh, you know, Faskar and talking about a revolution and all the other great songs that she wrote. And so she had to put in that work to achieve the excellence. But she also needed the exposure and this exposure happening to be there, you know, uh, uh, sort of worked out. One without the other would not have happened. There would have been absolutely no point her being on a stage side if she didn't have great songs to sing. Uh, in fact, they wouldn't even have asked her if she wasn't actually a musician with, uh, uh, you know, stuff out there. And equally, it would have been pointless writing songs like Faskar if they didn't actually reach the world. And this is a trade-off that I think about, the trade-off between excellence and exposure, because I believe we need to get both right. Both of them uh, sort of matter uh, a lot to me. So I want to ask you for your thoughts on this, because I have often heard you talk particularly about how excellence matters, how our dharma is, uh, you know, just doing stuff and, um, you know, getting better at what we do and not thinking of the consequences. But equally, you've also spoken about the importance of luck in our lives. And I will ask you at this point to, uh, you know, say a few words in Sanskrit for us and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So when uh, you started talking with me about this, I remembered uh, my father started CMIE in 1976. And uh, it was the first time he had done a project like this. And he would go out of his way to go out every day, meet people and campaign for his project. And uh, he used to tell me a Sanskrit proverb, which runs charati charato bhaga, which translates to good things happen to those who walk. And he, he had that commonsensical vision that, you know, you're going to try to build an important new organization that you have to go out and talk to the whole world about it and sell them on the dream and get more and more people to join hands and participate in your project. So in a way, I've seen him consciously trying to run that policy of reaching out and talking about it and proactively going out of the house every day, finding meetings every day in an age before email and smartphones, establishing a group of conversations every day where he got to meet people and talk about what he was trying to do. When you say that it is this combination of that inner knowledge and capability, the craft, the excellence, multiplied by the uh, extent to which other people become aware and you have successfully communicated that knowledge, that capability, the dream, then as an economist, I'll immediately start saying, but there are trade-offs here. That if you could commit all your 100,000 hours into building the craft, it would be great. But then, you know, if you're just Jimi Hendrix practicing guitar only in the bathroom and never getting out of the bathroom, we have a problem. And on the other hand, in the modern world, we have so many people who are basically content-free hustlers who are just trying to go out and schmooze and actually know nothing. So then that's also pretty sad. So the puzzle is to put both together and, you know, to be able to find that right balance, that right combination of the knowledge, the hunger, the energy, the craft, the passion, and then of getting the word out to enough people out there so that, you know, some good things happen and the ideas explode and, you know, your life gets reshaped and the ideas find their rightful place in the world. Okay, so I feel that there is an interesting trade-off here and, you know, everyone and you, gentle reader, needs to ponder that trade-off that where am I? Am I in the right place? Do I need to be upping this a little and do I need to be pushing this up or down a little? Okay, in this, in my opinion, the first order primal problem in India is that in my opinion, people are just not committing themselves adequately to the first part, which is the craft, which is the knowledge, which is the doing. I meet lots of young people all the time and I feel the problem of our country is that people want a locked in, visible, clear reciprocity that give me this big lollipop and then I will put my 50,000 hours. And that's not how life works and that is just so limiting and I feel people are not giving their own life a chance. By putting up that precondition and saying that I will wallow around and waste my life until I get that clear bargain and the opportunity and then I'll start working and then I will do all the things that I require but you got to promise me the fruits of my labor that 
on my own, out of my own energy and my own passion, I'm not capable of devotion. You got to first give me a contract, pay me, give me promises, show me that life, my life will become great. Okay, I meet people who want to do India public policy, who want to say, show me the career path, so I'll become chief economic advisor or finance secretary or something. And oftentimes, the paths to these things take you down very odious trajectories and it, they end up sacrificing the actual journey of the knowledge. So I want to switch gears to the field of software where I feel we can see some of these things more clearly. One of the great things in the world has been the world of open source, of free software, of the Unix revolution. We talked about it in the Unix uh, episode. I'm actually depressed and disappointed at how little of that happens in India. You can't think of too many people in India who are part of that world and the essential part of that world is literally from the time people are teenagers and 20s. They just turn into the devoted attention to being part of some work and then doing it for years and years and years, for decades, without asking for any fruit. Okay, so think of Linus Torvalds as a teenager. He said to himself, I am going to write a Linux kernel. Okay, nobody offered him a salary, nobody offered him a job, nobody offered him a prize, nobody offered him fame, nobody offered him status, nobody offered him glory. Okay, he just said to himself, I'm going to write a Linux kernel. Okay? And there are many, many people who have done similar things. And out of that, we have fashioned the whole great world of Unix and the internet and uh, the open source revolutions. And I'm disappointed to say that we seldom see that in India. In India, people want a job, people want a career, people want to get paid. And then the flip side of that is really a low level of capability and you've got people who are taking instructions from some boss, from some contractor saying do this. And the contract comes along, they'll do that. When the contract ends, they'll stop doing that. There is a lack of the inner fire and the devotion and the ability to stay hungry and stay engaged with doing something for long years with no plausible reward. So this thing about asking for the reward or asking for the package, I feel is a very primitive state of, you know, being a third world country, of being a developing country, that people want to get a direct reciprocity between my effort and my outcome. And I, I think that is just the path to weakness and mediocrity, that we need a whole different culture where people will try to do great stuff. And lots of people will try. And there are no guarantees in life. There is no locked in. But, you know, as you and I have said so many times in this show, this is what you can do to be doing justice to yourself. That's all. you got to try. And, you know, we each of us have to find the flame inside us and pour pure oxygen inside it and support each other and encourage each other on our mad projects and try to do those things in a spirit of devotion and madness. And some of those things will become amazing and great. Many of those things will fall by the wayside. There is luck in the world. You can never tell when fortune will smile on someone. There's a line from a song. I don't know why fortune smiles on some and lets the rest go free. Okay, so you, you don't control these things. You've just got to be zen about it. But simultaneously, we have to find the energy and the passion to actually build that knowledge and build that excellence. And it is hard. Okay, so sometimes I want to whine about this whole 10,000 hours to expertise. Actually, glory and greatness is not 10,000 hours. It is way more than that. Okay, you think of Linus Thorvalds, you think of Ken Thompson, you think of Tracy Chapman, you think of uh, Jimi Hendrix, you think of Jimmy Page. They're not 10,000 hours. They are devotion over an entire life with ridiculous levels of intensity and effort. So it's way beyond 10,000 hours. It's too easy. I mean, you can kind of play piano in 10,000 hours. You'll get to playing Furalis. You'll play it reasonably well. That's not the same as actually creating something in this world, as imagining, as coming up with new ideas. That's a different level of intensity. And I would just like to say to everybody that do try because you know, what's the point of living if you don't?
So I have an observation uh, leading up to and another and a separate question after that really. And my observation is this that uh, I think I should clarify for people uh, watching this and our gentle readers that when you're speaking of the culture in India, we're not blaming individuals. Uh, you know, people respond to incentives, people respond to the ecosystem that they're part of. And it actually makes me a little sad that uh, for, for such a long period of time, we've been a poor country, there have been different kinds of scarcities. And it is therefore natural for a culture to come about where everything you do is goal directed and it's supposed to be instrumental ki beta ja ke IIT mein bharti ho, IIM karo, uh, city bank mein vice president bano and you only think in those terms and you don't uh, think of a higher order of things because you don't have the luxury of doing so. You have families to feed, you have, you know, you've seen the privations your parents might have gone through. So I kind of understand that that's my observation. And my question is really sparked by a newsletter I wrote today on the day of the recording, but it'll, uh, you know, uh, this episode will release maybe three weeks from now, uh, where, um, you know, there was something um, um, Namsita mentioned, which kind of struck me, where she uh, sort of invoked a virtuous cycle, where she said that I am happy when I am doing things well and I do things well when I'm happy, you know. So it's a virtuous cycle that happiness makes you productive and then that productivity fuels further happiness. And I was just musing aloud in that newsletter post about how there are, what other kind of virtuous cycles there can be, what other kind of vicious cycles there can be. And it strikes me that even here, even in terms of the attitude people bring towards their work, towards excellence and so on, that there can be a virtuous cycle that I do something for the sake of doing it, not because it will get me somewhere and it gives me joy. And because it gives me joy, I do more of it and it gives me more of joy, right? I st if I'm Linus, for example, I start messing around with Unix and I'm happy. I create something, I code something and I go deeper and deeper and deeper and it's a virtuous cycle towards excellence. And equally, they can be, and this applies especially so to musicians because I guess once you reach a certain level and you're doing things for the joy of it, you know, every lick that you come up with is self-validating and it, it generates more creativity from you. So the virtuous cycle is something that f I feel that is truly important for excellence to emerge but there's also a vicious cycle that if you are the kind of person who is feeling entitled and who is saying ki nahi I got this fancy PhD and all that and show me the path and you know give me the salary give me the importance give me the validation then if you don't get it you're bitter if you get it you're like okay I didn't really need to work for it it's a vicious cycle where the mediocrity and the entitlement perpetuate each other and that is something that every Everyone listening to this, I'd really like them to watch out for that because these are around us and honestly, you know, people are just responding to the conditions around them. You could get sucked into a vicious cycle without knowing it. And I think it is important to have the self-reflection to be able to say that, no, I'm, a, I'm going to break out of it. I'm not going to fall into this. Now, so what you say about credentialism is absolutely correct that uh, the most dangerous thing in being an IITN is the sense that I have arrived and is the respect and uh, support that everybody else gives. And so for a certain early years of the career, it is feasible for the person to basically stop trying. And then that's a catastrophe because then you're suddenly in a completely different zone of a lack of knowledge and inner weakness. You start understanding your own imposter syndrome. You don't get on the vicious cycle of doing things well and getting that pleasure or what you're doing well is a very different thing. I want to come back to the problem of being a developing country and having uh, poverty and the limitations of doing these kinds of lives. And I'm stealing all this from the great man, Richard Stallman, who basically, when confronted with these kinds of questions, has a pithy aphorism in the field of software, uh, where he says a good programmer will never starve. Okay, so like you can have a day job, but the day job doesn't have to be the beginning and the end of your life. So if you're able to put 10, 20 hours a week you're getting 500,000 hours a year. Okay, multiply by 10 years, multiply by 20 years, multiply by 30 years. Now you're getting somewhere. It can be an enormous edifice of knowledge, of expertise, of craft. Further, what happens all too often is that in the conventional career, you sort of get moved around a couple of different jobs and companies and roles and profiles. And they are all interesting and different in their own way. Whereas in your own personal life and projects, you can have far more coherence that I am going after this one thing and I'm doing it well and I'm doing it well. And you achieve some amazing depth 
of knowledge and expertise and something of world class. And again, I want to always emphasize these things take years. Like nothing gets done quickly. Like people tell me I want to participate in an open source project because within three months I'll be putting in some application and I want to show some GitHub on my resume. And I just want to kick them out of the office that, that nothing works like that. You have to be devoted. You have to take years to get anywhere. So actually it is perfectly feasible to have this hybrid life that you know you could be a real estate broker that sings blues music in the evenings and you could build a life like that. So these possibilities are alive and well in India today and it's the culture that has not caught up with the economic opportunities of a modern lower middle income India. So in the Indian elite, I think there are these kinds of opportunities that are rife all around us. It's the culture that has not caught up that, you know what, actually I have these choices. So I want to tell you another story now because I want to talk about the exposure part of it, of not just building excellence, but actually going out there in the world and being lucky. And this story is about how uh, a few months back I was in Starbucks um, at Versova and I was just sitting there and at some point uh, somebody on a couple of tables away from me, guy with a beard, uh, pleasant face, just says, hi, you're Amit, right? And I say, yeah, and then I recognize him and it's Vaibhav who runs Chalchitra Talks. And I've done a couple of uh, uh, different episodes of different shows that they have. So we knew each other online, but we never actually met. And uh, again, a, a person, and he's a person who really uh, increases his surface area of serendipity by really going out there and taking the initiative. But he came and said, hi, and I'm like, yeah, good to see you and all of that. And just as we were parting after our pleasantries, I realized that maybe a week from now, I figured that we might need a new crew, crew for our show, this show. So I took his number and when that time came that we needed a new crew, we needed to look for new people, uh, I messaged him and he sent me uh, Namsita's number and I got in touch. And, and, it's, and it's really worked out very well. We are very glad, um, you know, we have the crew we did. It's, it's, a, a, it's a blessing. It makes a huge difference to our lives. And, it, and I did not have gone to Starbucks that day. I could have stayed at home. You know, I am a, I'm a classic introvert. I don't go out much. I don't do stuff. That day I happened to go and this lucky thing happened and it really worked out for me. In a similar way, I think about how I should be getting out more because after all, I do the scene and the unseen, which is about interesting people and interesting lives. So I should be going to conferences. I should be going to lit fests. I should be going here. I should be going there. I do very little of it. I hardly do anything. And my approach towards my work has always been that my marketing nahi karunga. Like we've never marketed this show, never marketed the scene and the unseen. Um, you know, uh, my my sort of purest belief is a good product is the best marketing. I'm like, I'll build something good, I'll work hard on that, I'll put in the 50,000 hours or whatever hours it takes. And then if it is good, it will find its way in the world. Now I realize at one level that that is a bit idealistic. At another level, I feel wary of giving this advice to people because just because I got lucky doesn't mean that you will also, you know. And I know that there is a trade-off and I'm perhaps on the extreme side of the trade-off in terms of saying that I don't really want to go out there. You know, like Satra says, hell is other people. So sometimes I kind of, uh, you know, that's um, how um, uh, reserved I can feel sometimes. But at at another level, at a practical level, I think that if I'm doing so much good work, it deserves more eyeballs, it deserves more whatever. I should make an effort. So how should I think about this and to what extent is it dependent on the kind of person you are? Like in his book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell spoke of mavens, connectors and salesmen. And mavens are basically people who are deep into something, they're like experts. I think of myself as a bit of a maven, you know, that I do certain things, I put all my effort into them, whether I'm an expert or not as far as to judge, but I think in certain things I definitely am. And a connector, uh, like Weber is a great connector, is, is someone who'll go out in the world, he'll connect people, he'll make beautiful things happen through all of those connections. And that's what he does and he's great. And I think to some extent it's a question of personality. I don't have the personality to be a connector, to just turn to a stranger at a conference and say, hey man, I'm Amit, yaar, you know, what do you do? Tell me a bit. I don't have that. 
you know and and i wonder sometimes if i should through an act of intentionality try to be a little more like that i would like to be a little more like that but my personality is just maven ki bhai rabbit hole dhundo usme ghuso and you know you spent 10000 hours doing irrelevant thing perhaps but that's just who i am so how do you think about that because i feel that you are also a maven but i feel and correct me if i'm wrong you have taught yourself to be a connector as well yeah so uh, a couple of different things um, so you're absolutely right i also like really struggle in uh, getting to know new people it's it's always hard okay and uh, all of us look brusque and prickly from a distance but actually you know once you get going what is the line there are no strangers there are just friends you don't have yet beautiful hmm? so i think that's from even cowgirls get the blues by tom robbins um <clears throat> so i've also struggled with all these things here are some pieces of the recipe that i have figured that uh, there used to be a whole circuit of nice economics conferences in india and i was lucky enough that i got invited and got drawn into those conferences early in my career and that was very good for me and i'm grateful to the people who did that but in a way there has been a decline in the economics community in india and many of those conferences don't work so well anymore and uh, uh i have a, a sarcastic uh, angry uh, one liner i s- often say that the quality of a conference panel is inversely proportional to the fame of the people in it mm-hmm. because you know famous people powerful people are just so constrained by the modern world that you end up saying banalities so they may be very interesting in the zone of friendship and one on one with people they know well but once you have that position then once you go on a conference stage you end up having to say world peace and it's really not very interesting so i have become less interested in many of those kinds of conferences i have tried to find and create the space for conferences where the currency is knowledge and ideas and not fame okay, so where one is explicitly not trying to define a conference in terms of double quotes a great lineup of famous people then you know those conferences are for cii and fiki to do but not for the indian intellectual community to do so i've tried both in terms of the decisions of which conferences to go to and also my tiny role in trying to build some conference act type activities because i feel the country needs these things and you know we've got to try so that's been this uh balance that i've tried to create i used to get invited a lot to do teaching and for some time i used to think it's my responsibility that you know like teaching works so badly in india that if one can teach a little bit go do some lectures guest lectures teach a course occasionally then one should try and uh with the rise of the modern internet and the kind of outlets that you know have been built so i am co-editor of the leap blog we're now doing everything is everything there is an xkdr youtube channel there are there is a flow of working papers i write a fortnightly opinion piece at that point i say to myself that i've done my responsibility now after this i'm not accepting more speaking invites or more teaching type thing so generally when many a uh, <coughs> teaching or a uh, outreach type activity comes along i say look i've done my responsibility to the universe i've built all these things i point people to them and i say please use these things i'm not available because you know it would be a high opportunity cost of uh, doing these things finally on the connectors uh, thing uh, as i said um, at many points uh, in my life people have been very good to me <clears throat> uh, rakesh mohan shekhar shah suman beri uh kelkar montek a whole bunch of people have consistently been very good to me they have brought me into communities and when i was a new kid on the block they made me connected into the world of economists in india and i'm very grateful to them and so i try to do that as much as possible and i think i do two things differently compared to what other people might do one is i don't 
look at the world through the lens of credentialism. So I don't care about Harvard, MIT, IIT, whatever. I look at people, are you doing something interesting? So I don't care which journal it goes into. The name of the journal is not interesting. I want to see what's the idea, what's the question, what's the creativity. Are you asking important questions? Do you have a novel insight into the world? And I value those things. And then I try to you know, bring people together. I'll always suggest to person X, I think you should speak with person Y because I can map the human network and I think that person Y will find this interesting or you will learn something by talking to person Y. So I try to do that. And the other thing is that I think it's interesting to connect people across communities. So there are disciplinary boundaries. So economists talk to economists, economists know economists, but there's a great world outside which is not economics and so on. So there are many, many fields uh, there are people who are deeply connected into the world of finance, there's the world of public policy, there's the world of engineering and software and mathematics and statistics. And so I am a little bit connected into all those worlds. So oftentimes I feel I can add value by helping people come together across disciplinary boundaries. So the people who would not bump into each other in a conference out of serendipity. And I feel we add value like that. You introduced me to this great term earlier today, super connector. And there's, you know, pe people who are connectors across multi-disciplinary, uh, 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 you know, fields. And it appears that uh, you are one of them. Wanna be. One. <laughs> and I also want to, I also want to, you know, clarify for uh, gentle readers that surface area of serendipity is not just about, in my eyes, it's not just about going out there and meeting more people or doing networking, that terrible word, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also about reading a lot. The more I read the more I make it likely that something, some great insight will strike me, that I will read something beautiful that will affect me and change me. The more I I'm increasing my surface area of serendipity in that way. And you mentioned all the different things that you do. And that's again another thing that the more you do, ki podcast bhi karenge, YouTube bhi karenge, newsletter bhi likhenge, jitna aap kar sakte ho, you know, you do all of those different things, you're increasing your surface area of serendipity in terms of A, making lucky connections which happen through them, but B, in terms of actually changing something somewhere and C, every time we create something, we are getting a deeper understanding into ourselves and refining our own thinking. We are changing with every product that we create, with every piece that we write. And we can get lucky there as well. So I, I, I think, I, so I interpret this very broadly, the whole surface area of luck, surface area of serendipity thing. It's not just about getting out, putting yourself out there. It's about exposure, not just of you to the world, but of the world to you. Read more, watch more, think about ideas, all of that. I want to talk about uh, networks of people and six degrees of separation. Okay, So for a moment, play with me that the transmission of my knowledge, my craft, my passion, my attempts at building something. Imagine that that communicates to you correctly and imagine that it communicates to other people correctly. Okay, So imagine there's no transmission loss, that the ideas flow successfully. If so, in a way, one is done because the world is infinitely connected. Okay, so with six degrees of separation, I'm six degrees from Vladimir Putin. Okay, so then all I need to do is you're Jimi Hendrix, you're sitting in your bathroom, you need to step out and play guitar for one person and run back into your bathroom. Because then you're done because that one person is six degrees from everybody in the whole universe. And you've got the word out in a very easy way. Okay, so this is an idealized model. And in that idealized model that if transmission loss is low, then it's very efficient for all of us because then we can concentrate on the craft and the information the world gets around quite readily and then there will be the right time and the right place and the right room in the world where somebody will want X kind of knowledge, Y kind of capability, Z kind of craft and the phone call will come back to you saying, hey dude, can you do X for us? Okay, so in that ideal world, uh, you actually can get by with very little of an outward orientation, you just need to tell one person because then you're done, then Putin knows. Okay, so because it just spreads like wildfire over six degrees of separation. Now that's not the world we live in. There is transmission loss and every pipe has limited bandwidth. So what intensity and truth I am able to convey to you, a diluted version of that will go to the next person. So, you know, there'll be a transmission loss, transmission loss, and that doesn't work. Uh, because that's the reality of life that 
transmission, communication, the moments of trust. Trust is a complicated thing it's because you and I know each other for years that sometimes I can even say three sentences to you, but you will understand when I'm saying it with dead intent. I don't need a lot of time because today you know what it means when I'm saying something and I'm dead serious and I'm not talking nonsense or trash. You are always dead serious with me, Ajisha. <laughs> and I'm never dead serious with you. So I'm glad we got that sorted out. So now I want to make a opposite proposition that could we be world designers? Okay. So for a moment, let's get away from the unit of observation and optimization as a person and let's think about the culture. Okay. So if in the culture, we just do a little bit better on understanding each other, on being less jealous, of being less competitive, okay? Then we would learn to understand and appreciate each other's glories and each one is beautiful in their own way, okay? So we are all different and we are all beautiful and we are all fascinating in our own way. It's just a matter of, you know, getting to see that um, at the end of To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, she says about Bo Ridley that he was actually quite a nice person once you get to know him. And Atticus says, most people ask out once you get to know them. Okay, So I think most people are wonderful once you get to know them. And if the culture is one where words like resentment and envy and competition are diluted, then there will be better transmission in the elite network. And I think of India as a place where we are still at the early stages of forging the culture of the elite networks. We are not 500 years old. We are not 1,000 years old in the emergence of modern India. So I feel that to the extent, now once again back to the individual, to the extent that each of us will just like really make eye contact and understand the other and find the truth and the beauty and the value in the other without the... Uh, resentment about the other person doing something. I remember once you said, every time another person succeeds, a little part of me dies. I didn't say that. I quoted a friend. You quoted my my a sentiment friend. is the opposite. Right? Yeah, what yeah. are you saying? So I feel, no, that, Instantly that kind of, clarify this. Yeah. So I, withdraw I go, your statement and triplicate. I withdraw my statement. I meant that sentiment is a truly sad and wasteful one. It's a bad culture that does that. And the culture is made up out of a million behaviors, meaning we each of us, how we work with each other, how we talk to each other, how we learn to talk to each other is how we make the culture. So if we can downplay the demons of that resentment, the envy, the hostility, that sense of com competitiveness towards each other, then it just makes the world a better place because the transmission loss goes down and then everybody's cost of that communication goes down. Then we have to schmooze in less conferences. Wise words and, 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 you know, I think in India we are stuck in this vicious cycle of toxic negativity, of, you know, embracing narratives of victimhood and etc, etc. And we, we need to break out of this at some point and I hope that uh, we do so. Mid-episode recommendation, great book by Duncan Watts called Six Degrees. And at this point, like the other day I was thinking about it and uh, so if there's one degree of separation between me and somebody, that means I know somebody who knows somebody, right? No, no. You and me is one degree of separation. You and me is one degree. So I think that... Uh, I was thinking the other day that I am two degrees away from every famous person in the world. The six degrees apl applies when it comes to unknown people. I'm sure you're two degrees from Putin. You have, you know people who know him, you know, though why you should want that, that kind of proximity so, so even doesn't. Once I think Bill Clinton was president and I actually got into a conversation and I found many two degrees to Clinton. Oh, okay. I thought you, you were saying you got into a conversation with Clinton and because he knows everybody now. There you was know a conversation everybody. around yeah. six degrees of separation and I actually understood that I knew several people who knew him. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, you know, knowing famous people like that is like super easy. But uh, knowing some random guy in, you know, Wisconsin is, you know, that'll uh, be a bit of a stretch. So Amit, we're at the end of this show. What are your book recommendations for today? In a strange way, I can't understand why I feel inspired. So I'm going to recommend a film that inspired me when I watched it. I watched it, I think I must have been 19 or 20 when I watched it. Um, much younger actually, I must have been 17 or 18. A film called Dead Poets Society by Peter Weir. I know the movie very well. 
there so we have something in common and it's such a beautiful film and the ending always just makes me break out in tears just thinking about it I'm sort of uh, welling up already and it's a beautiful inspiring film and I haven't seen it in many many years so maybe I should go back and see it you know sometimes what happens is you like something when you're very young and then you assume later that nahi yaar wo thoda zyada ye tha zyada wo tha will I like it or whatever but I think that you know it, it's a, it's a deeply inspiring film especially the last scene if you know you know and uh, uh, yeah so that's that's kind of uh, you know sees the day carpedium No, Amit, I feel completely blank. I have no cool ideas to offer today. You cover up for me and produce a second recommendation. I'll produce a second uh, recommendation. Recently, I saw this beautiful film called Anatomy of a Fall. I wrote um, a, a, a newsletter post about that, which is also linked from the show notes. A marvelous film, and it it made me realize that bloody hell, this is a golden age of cinema. people will often look at marvel cinematic universe and some bollywood nonsense and they'll say oh we have dumbed down as a species and all of that crap hey no way world cinema is uh, you know at a fantastic place right now and getting even better every year the mummy film festival in bombay reminds me of that it's just a mind blowing feast of great cinema great art and it should inspire everyone just the quality of work that is out there mm-hmm. anatomy of a fall uh, won the golden palm at uh, khan and a uh, bunch of oscar nominations uh, and and it, it it's just a marvelous moving film that is also an acknowledgement of complexity like one thing i was really struck by is that any film by the nature of telling a story is essentially editing reality it is simplifying the world right any film any story has to do that at the same time great art is great because it acknowledges the complexity of the world and the trade off between the two is fascinating and i'm always i always love how great cinema pulls it off and anatomy of a fall not only pulls it off it is literally about this trade off between the urge to tell a simple story that is explicable and also an appreciation of the complexity of the world in the context of this courtroom drama and this domestic drama and whatever so it, it's a masterpiece and i would tell everyone watching this that if you don't watch world cinema if you watch one film every 3 years like ajay shah here you know change because there is great art happening and it can help you understand yourself better and uh, you know become a different person so anatomy of a fall tell me about the mummy festival i didn't know about it oh really so every year um, there's a film festival called the mummy film festival i think runs for about 10 days i i forget what the acronym stands for mumbai academy of moving arts or moving images or something like that and they get the best of world cinema so the b- best cinema from the cannes festival the venice festival the berlin festival and in general from across the world along with a showcase for great indian films and uh, i have um, so i every year this this year i couldn't because i was traveling and recording so i just got a couple of days but otherwise i plan the festival so i'm watching four films a day for 10 days it is my annual vacation there is nothing else that i do i just you know kind of uh, sink into it and it's a glorious uh, uh, time of the year for me so again you know just the good fortune i mean i increase my surface area of serendipity by being in mumbai where that festival is held close to versova in fact where a couple of the main theaters are where that happens uh so yeah that's that's uh, something that i look forward to every year i even did uh, tweet threads live tweet threads on it uh, for a couple of years we we'll link it from the show notes and yeah cinema is beautiful cinema is great increase your surface area of serendipity ajisha by watching as many films as you can don't go to boring conferences these all these economists say the same damn things no okay Gentle readers I have I want to share an experience with you a few weeks ago I went to watch a musical play by two young friends of mine and it absolutely blew me away and it made me realize that you know those old two sayings that they combine youth is wasted on the young wisdom is wasted on the old they are not actually true all the time sometimes the young have wisdom and youth on their side and I want to call sort of the two main uh, creators of this play right here right now Vashram and Namsata come here run 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 faster have you run stop running <laughs> right so these are our brilliant uh, young uh, crew who help us put this show together you know the outdoor location and everything good about the show in recent times all the credit goes here some of it to me and none of it to ajay and i just want to say that uh, you know uh, magic fruit which is a play written by 
uh, Vaishnav. Remarkable musical play, more than an hour long, incredible creativity, incredible ambition uh, and enterprise and it will make you think and look in different ways and I'm not just saying that because they're my friends, it's, it's absolutely true. That's got a show coming up this week later in Bombay on the 29th, right next Friday. On the 29th of March 2024, a historic date. You know, we'll give the link up, uh, up on the screen and in the show notes. So please do watch it because one day, 30 years later, 40 years later, perhaps 90 years later, if you're 30 and you live till 120, you'll be able to tell people, I was there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was there.